Hi, I'm James McGuire, and on today's eSpeaks, we're taking a look at the limitations of generative AI, about how this new and exciting AI technology with so much potential has downsides like inaccurate and biased responses. We'll also take a look at how to handle these problems. To discuss that, I'm joined by Garib Garibi, Head of Artificial Intelligence and Director of Applied Research at Triple Blind. Garib, very good to have you with us today. Thanks for having me, James. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, you've written something I think is really interesting that I, I think is very timely and very topical. You, you wrote this, and I'll quote, despite generative AI models' powerful abilities, they still generate inaccurate, inappropriate, and biased responses. Of course, we've, we've seen that. We've seen a lot of headlines about that. There have been some major problems in that. How big of a problem is this based on your research? Um, it is actually a very big and serious problem. Um, it is big because uh, every business today is trying to adopt these new wonderful technologies. Everyone, we see an ever-growing number of domains that they want to start using uh, GPT-like chatbots everywhere from like simple mobile phone games all the way to healthcare systems. They are very excited about generative AI. And that's why it is big. Everybody wants to uh, ride this uh, wave of hype. And it is serious because these AI systems are put to make uh, some also some very serious decisions, like when they are used in healthcare. So um, before talking about biased AI systems, let's just take a second to define these systems. Sure. So AI models in general are nothing but programs that generalize from data, right? So basically, we just give a very big amount of data to this AI algorithm that can automatically extract patterns from this data and be able to make predictions about new samples in the future. And therefore, if the data that we corrected is coming from a single source or if the data itself is biased, then this program that generalizing from this data is also going to be uh, biased as well. Right, right. So, Think of like a hospital that is serving a specific uh, demographic of patients. Mm -hmm. That hospital wants to create an AI system. They have their own data. Their data is already biased. This model is very likely to make inaccurate predictions or diagnosis for patients that are from outside that demographic area. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's basically the bias of AI systems. And um, the majority of AI systems that we have today are called data centric. So they generalize from data. There is no systems that are capable to fixing themselves. <laughs> mm -hmm. If you want to say um, that yet, I think that's going to happen in the very near future. But today, all of these systems are just trained by using large amounts of data. The data is biased, so the systems are biased. So it's a very big problem and it's serious one because we're using AI in a lot of uh, sensitive domains. You know, I think that is the problem. You, you, you nail it. I think it's interesting you say, well, the, the system is biased and so the, the output is going to be biased. And you're, you're saying that the system doesn't have the capability to correct its own bias, but it will perhaps in the future. That's a pretty interesting idea. So it's almost like the, the large language models or whatever data repository is feeding the AI algorithm is, is somehow corrected by the algorithm itself. Is that what you're suggesting? I am. I think... Um... Over the next uh, couple of years, or maybe less, a little bit less than a decade, mm. we are going to see AI systems that are very, very powerful. And mm. these AI systems will have the capil a ability to actually create other AI systems. Mm. And as a humans, we'll be able to say or direct these AI systems to say, here, this system is actually biased, do some magic. <laughs> Mm -hmm. to create or derive a newer version of that system that is less biased. So I believe that AI systems are evolving in like a, in a way that we cannot even uh, fathom or understand yet. And mm -hmm. these AI systems are going to become super powerful that they can create, correct their own selves or create a newer versions of themselves that have less problems. And so there, these systems in less than a decade will help us mitigate or remove bias from the data and then in a decade or so these systems will be able to fix themselves and create a new versions that are smarter or more intelligent than themselves so i believe like this is the late phase of uh, we are in, in a late stage before that uh, era hmm. where AI systems are creating more intelligent systems i i've certainly heard that i've heard talk of well 
you know, GPT-6, which doesn't exist yet, GPT-6 will write GPT-7. I don't know if that's real or not, but I, I've heard people say that. Um, but I think your idea that the systems would be self-managing and self-correcting is pretty profound in that they are only a product of whatever large language model is feeding them. So, of course, I mean, the, really the reason they're biased now is because we humans are biased, and so all they've done is really record our bias. So it's no surprise that these systems are, are quite inaccurate and biased. But you're, you're envisioning a, 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 a future where, I guess, the, the repository itself would be less biased. It's almost like the, for that to be true, the humans themselves would need to feed them a non-biased uh, worldview. I'm not sure even how to ask the question, but how, how would that be developed? I guess is my real question. How, how would this non-biased system come to exist if, if we ourselves, are, 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 we humans are so biased? I think I have to point back to one of the key words that I used earlier. Data, the systems we have today are more data centric. Mm -hmm. GPT-7 or maybe 8 is most, did you mention 6 or 7? I, I forgot which version you mentioned. But Six, probably, seven. let's say, ChatGPT-7 is most likely or probably not going to be as data centric as ChatGPT-4 is. Hmm. This means that the actual process that these models train from data is going to change. Uh, today, we just throw huge amounts of data on the models, and they need to figure out the patterns in the data. In the future, maybe these systems are going to start learning more like humans. Uh, I don't really need to see thousands of samples of something in order to understand it. I can read something one time, and I will really understand it. And that's not how majority of AI systems work today. Hmm. So in the future, the systems are... ChatGPT 7 is most likely going to be created in a different way. It's going to have maybe a different architecture. It will have the capability to look back in all the human resources, all the books that we have ever written and say, okay, uh, this is biased, this is not biased, and teach itself um, after, after the fact of training it. Hmm. So this it is one of the possible ways. So we will have systems that are less data-centric, they can access the internet and they can read about all of our wars in the past, et cetera, and say, well, mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. good to not have these wars. And in one way to reduce the possibility of having uh, World War III is actually reducing the bias and making sure that all of these outputs are actually uh, good and in favor of humans, et cetera. And um, hopefully we'll have a good AGI. <laughs> I, I, I really li I like the sound of that. Um... Well, let's let's bring it back to the current day. If say this is a company or an organization that that wants to handle a, a, you know, a, a chatbot, what are your recommendations on on managing bias in, in you know, pri privacy preserving explainable AI systems? How, how can companies deal with that now in the present day? Yes, again today these systems are data centric. So in order to create something really uh, powerful, privacy preserving, and uh, generalizable that is less biased. Then you need to train on large amounts of data that are diverse enough to cover all possible scenarios. So if we are talking about healthcare domain, then you want data, your training data to be representative of different demographics, of different healthcare scenarios, of different contexts, etc. And unfortunately, that's very difficult because usually if you're a healthcare system, then you only have access to your own data in order to build a system that in order to collect data that is uh, representative uh, of the majority of the people, you need to access data on by other healthcare uh, systems. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's difficult because of competition, because of privacy, regulations, HIPAA in the United States. And then there's a point where you actually want to train on multinational data. You want to mm. pull data from Europe and from the Middle East. And mm -hmm. it becomes even more difficult because different restrictions, different policies, different laws. Um, and that's where a company like Triple Blind, where I work, come into the picture. We enable you to actually train on data that you don't own without violating the privacy of that data. So to make good systems that are privacy preserving and respecting people's privacy and less biased, you need large amounts of data. Mm -hmm. So you need a system that enables you to access data owned by other organizations. And um, 
you also make you want to make sure that when you are training these systems, uh, you are recording everything and documenting and being more transparent on how these systems are created. And even after you are done with training them, you want to validate these systems on data that you did not use to train. So if we collected data from thousands of hospitals from the United States, uh, let's test that system on data that's coming from Europe data from outside our uh, distribution here. So we also need to validate on uh, very diverse data sets. And when we deploy these systems, finally, we wanna make sure that we are monitoring them and we are monitoring this their results all the time. Mm -hmm. So collect on large amount, train on large amounts of diverse high quality data, make sure that you document the process and your training process is privacy preserving. There's a wide range of privacy enhancing technologies today, federated learning or our own in-house method to train on diverse data. We call it blind learning because you never get to see the data, but you can generate models from this data in order to preserve their privacy, differential privacy, secure multi-party computation. And, um, you make sure your training process itself is privacy preserving. Once you deploy the model, you monitor it and you make sure that the outputs are also respecting people's privacy and your model is not hallucinating or spitting out sensitive information about patients. Well, you bring up an important point about the nature of the large language model. It seems that that's gonna be the big competitive advantage that companies sometimes can build their own large language model. Sometimes they need to use the LLMs that are already built. That's not as good. It's expensive, of course, to build such a repository. How does how does Triple Blind do it then? You're saying that it, it's it's offering a, a, a variety, like a, an exchange or a, a, a market for large language models, but it's, it's uh, anonymous. Tell, tell me how that works, please. That's that's a wonderful question. So basically, what what we do is we have created several new privacy enhancing methods that allow any data scientist, let's say in hospital A. Uh, to train on data by hospital B and C. And the location of hospitals B and C are actually not important. Hospitals B and C never have to share the data with the data scientists from hospital A. And uh, yet the scientists at hospital A can still train a model. Simply, we have created a set of tools uh, that are privacy preserving and that are automated. Um, so the, the scientists at hospital A can actually create a model and today, the good thing is that there's a lot of companies that are creating these foundation models. So we have models that are as good as ChatGPT created by OpenAI, but are they open sourced? So as a data scientist, you start from that model. That model has already been trained on a large amount of the uh, data coming from the internet. So these models understand language, et cetera, but they're not very good at one specific domain. So the data scientist, what the data scientist does is says, okay, I have this large foundation model, let's say Llama 2, 30 billion parameters. I want to now make it fine tune it on data from uh, hospitals in order to be able to answer questions about uh, ICD-9 or 11 codes, for example, for billing um, or, or diagnosis, et cetera. So our tool set will enable the data scientist to fine tune this model um, without having to access uh, the data itself or without replicating the data in different resources using again privacy enhancing technologies like LoRa, low rank adaptation you'll be able to take this a huge model and only train small parts of it and uh, this will enable you to take a foundation model that does not understand a lot about the medical domain and then you fine-tune it to become an expert in very specific tasks um, can, can I yeah. ask you a question? Can, can you remind this? It's an acronym. Is, is it pronounced Laura? Is that it? Yes. So Laura. And, and what, are, what are the four letters in the acronym? And, and what does it stand for again, please? Yeah. L-O-R-A. Low okay. rank adaptation. Uh, so it's four letters, but three words. The first two okay. L-O is for low rank adaptation. Yeah. All right. Simply speaking, if you have a model that has 30 billion parameters, uh, empirical results and research has showed and demonstrated that you don't actually need to retrain all of these parameters in order to take a general purpose model or a foundation model and then make it an expert in a specific domain. We can only fine tune or retrain small parts of the model. Uh, so we are saving memory, we are saving computations, and we are having models that uh, are experts in specific domains better than ChatGPT, et cetera. 
and all of that while preserving the privacy of the underlying patients or their data that we are using for the training. Um, so does, does the privacy preservation, let me see if I know this works. So, so science, data scientist who's going to train on the model from hospital A, he or she has access perhaps to that, but, but he, also, he or she also wants to train on data from other hospitals. I guess it is anonymized. So for example, they know how many penicillin you know, shots have been given on, on hospital B and C, but they don't know who the shots have been given to. Is, is that the way it's been anonymized? How, how does that work? We don't really anonymize the data. We use uh, advanced training methods that prohibit the models from memorizing some, some of this data. So there's something called differential privacy, for example. When you're training on data from hospital B, we make sure that the model is adding certain amount of noise to the different samples that it sees in the data so that the output of the model will never leak any information about any specific patient. Um, so even though the model have seen the record of Garib Garibi or uh, James in the hospital, the mm -hmm. model will not memorize or anything specific about these two patients mm -hmm. or in other technical words that will never leak sensitive information about uh, these records. And that's something done with uh, using differential privacy for the training. And then after you train these models on different hospitals, you need to bring them back together and consolidate them in one model. And we do that using something called secure multi-party computation. Hmm. And it's a very fancy term to saying uh, we can aggregate or average all the models trained on different hospitals locally. Uh, in a secure way without any of the parties or hospitals involved in this computation, which is the averaging, being able to see other data. So secure multi-party, for example, can answer a very simple question. Which one of us is uh, more wealthy today? Like let's mm. talk dollar amount. Right. And you can answer that question without you telling me exactly your net worth and without me telling you exactly my net worth, but mm. the output will be James is, for example, more wealthy than Gareeb. <laughs> and, uh, we wishful thinking, but okay. <laughs> so um, that's uh, that's how secure multi-party computation works. We can solve a mathematical problem between both of us. And in this simple example, it was just a bigger than or lower than, right? Which amount is bigger than. But mm -hmm. you will never learn anything about uh, my data, and I will never learn anything about your data, but we'll both be able to see the answer. So these two methods, we are not, I don't like the, the, the term anonymization because in scientific, uh, as a technical term, anonymization has its own meaning. Like we take names and we, uh, for example, encrypt them or hash them. And anonymization has proved to not work. Mm. There's actually a, sci a, a scientist at uh, Google called Cynthia Dwork has proved that already. And she said, anonymization isn't or mm. anonymized data isn't. Mm. Uh, just proved that we can break uh, the privacy of anonymized data. So there's a new privacy enhancing technologies that enable us to preserve the privacy of the training data uh, without anonymizing it. Interesting, okay, it's a, it's a significant difference. Uh, let's look to the future. You've, you've talked about it in one very fascinating way, how the algorithm or the AI system would be able to self-correct for bias. What, what else do you see in the future of generative AI in the years ahead, especially as it concerns accuracy and bias? What, what milestones can we look forward to? It definitely, first and foremost, these models are be going to be more powerful. Uh, their prediction results are going to become more accurate. We are going to have systems that operate on ev evidence-based outputs. It's going to make sure that whatever it's outputting is actually have evidence that it can cite it mm -hmm. and verify this information before it's actually answer our prompts. Mm. And uh, it will be able also to tell how biased the data we are using. And then maybe it can synthesize uh, new samples of data for the underrepresented groups and the data itself. Mm -hmm. And um, Again, these systems probably, today, ChatGPT can generate code. So ChatGPT 7 probably can create and will create ChatGPT 8, and um, right. it will be able to figure out the, the problems uh, that are leading these AI models to be biased, the data and the methods of the training themselves, and it's probably going to overcome it. And um, that's probably where we are going to reach a point in time where we will have uh, intelligence explosion. It's mm. like imagine 
today, even today, we are. I mentioned earlier that we are living in the late uh, phases of before of that information explosion, or maybe singularity is a very mm. <laughs> similar term there. It's like yeah. if you think of this iPhone I have here. I will buy the next one before I explore all of the features of this one. Sure. So in the future, ChatGPT 7 is going to create ChatGPT 8 before we comprehend what ChatGPT 7 is capable of doing. And mm. ChatGPT 8 is going to create 9 and 10 even faster than that. And then these systems are going to become just super powerful and intelligent that they are going to hopefully save a lot of the problems, maybe... Uh, the environment problems that we have make a human life's expense expectancy higher, et cetera. You're, you're, so you're almost suggesting that the singularity is within reach. Am I hearing you correctly or, or not necessarily? You don't, you don't want to use the term singularity or, or you do? No, I, I'm, I'm comfortable with that. But so uh, and for intelligence explosion and similarity are almost very close terms, but they have a little bit of differences. And I don't want to really predict which one is going to come first, but uh, it is within reach. I don't think it will be here more than a couple of decades it's going to be here before within 20 years or less wow okay that's a that's a grieve you that's a big I, prediction okay that's that's interesting all right i usually uh try not to make such predictions but it seems like today if you look every day there's at least 1000 papers about large language models being published right so we are not able to consume the amount of intelligence that we are generating today. And these models will be able to consume them much faster than uh, we are as humans. Mm. Uh, so there's a lot of new technologies that are coming out today that uh, it's evolving very fast. And basically singularity is that point of time where everything is going to evolve so fast that in one day you probably have 10 or 100 new uh, technological advancements and uh, if you look at it in, in in LLM domain for example today that's that's already happening every day there's a new advancements in the LLMs they are becoming bigger smarter more powerful of course we still have the problems of bias and hallucination but we are gradually working on solving them so yeah, Reeb, it's, it, it's been absolutely fascinating to talk with you. I, I think that it's a really interesting forecast, and I, I don't doubt it necessarily. It's pretty wild, but I, you know, who can say? Yeah. Uh, at any rate, thank you so much for sharing your insight today, and I, I hope you come back and talk with us again sometime. It was great. Same here. I, I enjoyed talking with you, James. Thanks for having me.